Hello everyone and welcome. Canary Media is happy to bring you this free webinar uh, entitled Transactive Energy 101 with Lynn Kiesling and me, Jeff St. John, Editor-in-Chief at Canary Media. So the concept of transactive energy um, is essentially enabling individual members of an energy network, i.e. a power grid, uh, either at the small scale or the national scale for that matter, to trade energy and services amongst each other. And it's been around for more than a decade at least. Um, yet the definition of transactive energy remains a matter of some debate amongst those who use it. And its implementation has largely been confined to pilot projects to date. It's really been a, a, a bit of a, a energy conference uh, uh, matter rather than a real world application. And yet, with grid flexibility becoming increasingly important and the technologies that would make up a transactive energy network like solar batteries, EV chargers, and smart and flexible loads becoming more and more cost effective and, and prevalent on the grid, it seems like now is a good time to truly start to understand uh, and examine the potential of transactive energy. Thankfully, we've got an expert on hand to explain it to us today. Economist Lynn Kiesling, uh, Lynn, who is currently co-director of the Institute for Regulatory Law and Economics at the University of Colorado at Denver, has done some pioneering work on the topic of transactive energy. Lynn's going to help us understand what we mean when we talk about transactive energy, how the concept and the underlying technologies and methodologies behind it have evolved, and what utilities and policymakers are getting right and wrong when it comes to implementing it at scale. Thanks, Lynn, thanks, Jeff, away. and thanks for inviting me for what I hope is going to be an interesting conversation. You you really started off by motivating things, I think, extremely accurately, that the electric grid is changing. We are in the midst of what we're coming to call a, a great energy transition. And the transition has certain characteristics. It's because the um, the increase in distributed energy resources, DER, the, the um, small scale photovoltaic, um, small, obviously small scale electric vehicles and increasingly uh, cost effective storage are changing the, the scale at which resources can operate economically in this shared network that we call the, the distribution grid. Digitization is a big part of making that happen. Um, I very strongly think that digitization is the underappreciated clean energy technology, and it's digitization that really enables the interconnection of all of these very heterogeneous resources together, much more heterogeneous than the resources that we think of in the kind of 20th century electric grid context. But there's more potential for consumer engagement that hasn't been tapped. While at the same time, we want to recognize that um, especially residential customers don't want to be their own home energy managers. And so we can take advantage of technology to enable them to get the benefits of energy management without having to bear the costs. Um, in econ speak, we essentially say that the participation in management and, and markets uh, is more possible now because digitization has led to falling transaction costs. We're also seeing at the at the grid level changing operations and features uh, at the distribution utility. So we think th these changes can be really destabilizing, and we see that in in some instances, for example, in California. And my colleagues and I think that transactive energy can help. One of the things that that is you know we we focus on a lot in economics is of course the role of incentives, and so. Um, Transactive energy can help to align the operational and economic incentives at the individual and the system level. And so that's that's something that we focus on. So I'm gonna run through the operating definition that we tend to use of transactive energy, which is decentralized coordination of demand and supply at the distribution level using market processes and automation. I'm gonna highlight some pieces of that in turn. The first piece is decentralized coordination. And this, uh, I, I put decentralized coordination in there as a, a contrast um, to the traditional engineering approach in power systems of centralized control. 
And uh, decentralized coordination is something that uh, that markets do. You know, that's, that's kind of the bread and butter of markets is the idea that you have thousands and thousands and thousands of individual producers and individual consumers, and they don't know each other. They don't know each other's preferences. They don't know each other's costs. And yet they're working in a, in the same you know, society, you know, economics being a social science. And so this is a social network. Um, how do they coordinate the actions and plans, not just in the immediate term with the resources they have, but over time, right? So it's a, it's a kind of a short term uh, static uh, coordination, given the resources we have right now, but then that long term dynamic, how do we invest in different systems and different pieces of capital, and how do we coordinate all of that across different individuals who don't know each other's actions and plans? Uh, and so clearly that gets us to demand and supply because we are talking about the interaction of buyers and sellers. This is completely in keeping with the way that the electric power system has always operated, that you know, there's production and there's consumption. Historically, of course, production and consumption and never the twain shall meet, but now of course we have my least favorite neologism, prosumers. And so depending on what's going on in the network, what's going on in your life, uh, you can choose whether or not you want to be a producer or a consumer if you have an electric vehicle or PV or, or some uh, form of storage. And, uh, and so that creates a more complex, a, a more complex landscape and uh, coordination in that complex landscape of demand and supply is, is going to be of increasing priority. Uh, I'm gonna skip distribution level and just say market processes. And by market processes here, we mean uh, just the use of um, market rules, market designs and market mechanisms, which is primarily prices and price signals uh, I think it is the most important feature of, of transactive energy is that price signals are informative. Price signals carry some of that private information that all of those individuals have, and they communicate some of it to everyone else. And that, that informative role of prices is crucial. And without that informative role of prices, we don't have really deep coordination. Uh, and finally, automation is what makes this feasible and potentially attractive to a lot of people because it enables technologies to implement our preferences, implement if we're a buyer, our willingness to pay. If we're selling, it implements our offer, what we're willing to sell at, and it implements the results of these market processes without uh, without the necessity for human involvement. So for residential customers, this means we can go out and live our lives without having to be deep home energy managers, which is a good thing. Uh, we, uh, and again, I, I will say I am an economist and not an engineer. And so I always start from the economics. So when I think of transactive coordination, the idea is a, um, is a market demand and supply. And so you can think of a supply curve here. It's, you know, you've got sort of a, a single, a single supply resource at a fixed marginal cost, which is why the supply curve has that horizontal part. And then the vertical part just reflects the capacity of the resource. The blue is the demand curve and what the different the different heterogeneous re, uh, devices bidding into the market tells you it, it gives you it gives you some of that elasticity. Right. So you have on the left side there, the vertical part of the demand curve is is not what we call non controllable load. So that's going to be like lighting and, and stuff like that. In, if you have the devices in your home that are participating in a transactive system and you can set the willingness to pay and that device bids into the market and you have different consumers with different willingness to pay, it gives you that responsiveness or that elasticity in the middle of the demand curve. And so uh, let's say, for example, that um, your thermostat submitted a bid of um, P hat, which is below the market clearing price. Um, your thermostat would have to change its settings because it was not willing to pay enough to pay the market clearing price. So it would have to change its settings so that it's using less electricity. 
Uh, as Jeff alluded to, um, the origins of transactive energy, I, I put in the Gridwise Olympic Peninsula Test Spread Demonstration Project at the Pacific Northwest National Lab in the mid 2000s. I was part of the team that implemented that project. And the idea was, um, we, it was a field experiment with 130 households. Uh, and the experiment had two elements to it. One was a technology element. And so the 130 households all had a two-way programmable communicating thermostat. And so the thermostat could receive the market price signal and could be programmed to take an action autonomously in response to that price signal. It could also push information out to, uh, to other parties as well. The second part of the experiment was um, having people on different types of contracts. So how does how, does how they're paying for uh, their electricity affect their decisions? Uh, and so we had three pretty conventional types of contracts, a fixed price that was just constant all the time um, and was set at a level that had an embedded you know, insurance premium built into it because you're being insured against price volatility. Uh, the second was a critical a time of use with a critical peak component. And then the third was the real time market. And uh, the real time market is really where the, the kind of transactive rubber hits the road because those, um, those consumers who had that contract were receiving the price signal in real time and their devices, in this case thermostats, were responding autonomously. Uh, and we uh, had them all participating in a real-time market and it was a five minute market um, based in, in the, the foundations of this are in experimental economics and the idea of what, uh, of auction design and auction theory uh, and was designed as what's called a double auction. And so in a double auction in every market interval, the sellers all submit their offers, the buyers all submit their bids, the computer algorithm arranges them into a supply curve and a demand curve that algorithm enables the discovery of the market clearing price, which is then pushed out to all the devices and the devices are programmed to respond accordingly, right? So if you're a thermostat and you, your submitted bid was higher than the market clearing price, you just keep your settings. If your submitted bid was lower than the market clearing price, you have to adjust your settings. Fast forward you know, 15 years, uh, which is a bit shocking to say. And, and we're working on the same foundational concepts. And, and I have to give um, a lot of credit here to my longtime collaborator, Dave Chasson, who's at Slack National Laboratory and was at PNL. And so he and I collaborated together on the Olympic Peninsula Project with the others on the team. And what, uh, what we're working on right now at a theoretical level in terms of the economics is incorporating the DER that were not part of the equation in, in 2006. In 2006, it was thermal loads, you know, thermostats, water heaters, um, the chillers for the freezer in, in your fridge. Those were the things that could give you the flexibility and the adaptability to, um, and at the time it wasn't so much flexibility and adaptability that were important. It was how do we improve capacity utilization, in this case on the Olympic Peninsula, so that as demand grows or as, as populations grow in a region, demand doesn't necessarily grow in a way that requires you to build out additional feeders or additional generation. Uh, and so this, at the time, it was more of a capacity utilization challenge. Now we've, you know, in, in the 15 years that have ensued, we have this growth of DERs, the, the more cost effectiveness of them. And as these more heterogeneous um, resources have entered the grid, there's now, I think, a higher priority on resources that are more flexible and, and, and um, system designs that allow for more adaptation to unanticipated uh, circumstances. And so, for example, we are right now working on thinking about how batteries fit into to a transactive system. And of course, the, the, the bids that they will submit, or I should say offers, because they're on the sell side here, are going to depend on their state of charge. 
Um, well, they're on the sell side if they're actually willing to discharge. If they need to charge, then of course they're on the on the demand side. So batteries are a really interesting and very complicated resource, but they can pr potentially provide a lot of flexibility. I think transactive systems are relevant in a bunch of different use cases at a bunch of different scales. Like Jeff, you said, you know, at you know, kind of local distribution level up to national level. So one of the things that I think is going to be important as we examine how to make buildings more energy efficient is getting the flexibility and the adaptation and the autonomous management within a building that you can get from doing a transactive system. And then you know, within, within a building or within a microgrid, you can manage those transactively, but then that also gives you capabilities. And I'd like us to stop thinking about capacities and think about the capabilities of resources. So if you manage these transactively, it gives you capabilities that you can then bid in to other, other markets outside of your building or outside of your microgrid. So, so my big pitch, and, and this will give us something to talk about, I think, over the next few minutes is, um, take, for example, this is my use case for Transactive as a flexibility and, and decentralized coordination uh, approach. Uh, think about the duck curve in California, the problem of increasing PV being available midday, but then coming off quickly at five, six o'clock in the evening, requiring other resources to do a very fast and very costly ramp on at six, seven in the evening to meet evening demand. And this is a, from an operational perspective, this is quite costly. We also know that we are increasingly seeing electric vehicles. And so my suggestion would be uh, to have uh, you know the PV and the EVs connected together in a local energy market. And the owners, um, whether they're at home or they're out at a charging station, they've got some, some trigger price, some willingness to pay for uh, charging their EV. And in the afternoon, as that PV comes on and you have more and more solar coming into the market, it increases the supply, it increases the supply, it increases the supply, the supply curve shifts out. And so if you're in a local energy market, the price you'll discover as the supply shifts out is going to be falling. And if you push that price out to these EVs, once the market price is below the EV trigger price for an individual owner, then they'll start charging. And then it goes lower. And then for me, because I like a low price, I'm going to start charging. And so different, the fact that different people have different willingnesses to pay and willingnesses to accept for, for buying and selling gives you some of that fluidity, flexibility, adaptation to, um, to skinify that, that duck and take out that fat belly and still provide everyone with the reliability and resilience and capabilities that they want out of their system. I've been working on a project that Dave Chasson at Slack is leading with Holy Cross Energy called Transactive Energy Service System or TESS. Uh, and this is our version 1.0. And we're working with Holy Cross Energy in Colorado in their um, project called the um, uh, Basalt Vista Project, which is an affordable housing project in partnership with Habitat for Humanity and some other local um, sort of local government agencies. And all of the affordable housing that Habitat for Humanity has built is 100% uh, electric and it's tricked out with you know, PV panels and you can, there's an EV charger set up. There's a place where you can plug in a battery. And um, so there's all sorts of capabilities there to, to have transactive coordination and, and um, you know, control and participation in local energy markets. Uh, and so we are currently building out this platform and, and working on thinking about the market design. And, uh, and I will say just as a, as a conclusion, this is, is our particular approach and it's very focused on the bottom up individual economics, the willingness to pay and willingness to accept the auction design. So there are, are different ways of thinking about transactive systems. Uh, and I think uh, ours just really focuses on the bottom-up economics and the idea of price discovery in a very distributed, complex system. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lynn. This is 
I mean, it, it is so fascinating, and we've got a lot of really interesting questions. You know, there, there's so much to get into here, um, including, I think, the fact that you pointed out very much that what transactive energy is depends very much on what it is designed to be. Um, uh, we have a lot of questions uh, regarding the role that uh, price signals play um, and whether or not a real-time or near real-time price is a necessary uh, constituent part of a transactive energy uh, kind of uh, mechanism or system? So the short answer is yes, um, but <laughs> yes, prices are, are important and I would argue kind of necessary. So I have several thoughts, but I'll, I'll limit it to about three. Um, price signals are really, really important. And uh, I think at a fundamental economics level, the ex and, and I think it's not something that's really generally appreciated about prices is that prices are information. And the more you dilute the information that's going into the system, the poorer the system is going to perform at achieving its objectives. We have a lot of data to show that you can get the benefits of price flexibility without having 100% of customers on a dynamic price. And so, yeah, one of the, it's, it's a kind of a robust, it's a robust phenomenon from complexity theory, the Pareto rule, 80-20 rule. So you get kind of 80% of the benefit from having 20% of people or 20% of, of load uh, being fully price responsive. So if you have 20%, if you have 20% in a transactive system, you get most of the benefit. If you have 20% on dynamic pricing, you get most of the benefit. The Holy Cross Energy Project is a great example of that because they are obviously we're working with the co-op and the co-op is a vertically integrated utility. They are the kind of monopoly provider in their territory and they want to use transactive to in this in this um, in this neighborhood to test the capabilities of those homeowners and their devices to be able to provide resources to enable Holy Cross Energy to achieve some operational objectives. So in their case, Holy Cross Energy has a wholesale contract with a wholesale provider and the contract has, and I think most, most utility kind of wholesale contracts have something equivalent to a coincident peak charge. So I think you can have these different operational objectives that inform how you design the system. Um, I will say though, and this, this is potentially a controversial claim and it might give us something to talk about and gets us into policy. Uh, I do think that given the fractures we've seen in net metering, in net energy metering, I think a transactive system is a a, a well-suited substitute for net metering. I think net metering is an analog era regulation that is ill-suited to the demands of a high DER digital uh, electric system. And I think transactive would be a much better alternative for enabling DER owners to uh, be paid for the benefits that their DER provides. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of the rates pilot program in Southern California featuring the company called yep. T-Mix, uh, led by Ed Cazalet, a, a former Kaiso guy who's been a transactive energy uh, kind of booster for years. And, and that's a really interesting project in that it, it, it seeks to integrate those non-volumetric costs, the costs that we pay every month on our bill for our tiny sliver of what the utility had to spend on keeping its distribution grid uh, maintained and upgraded over time into a kind of a nominal kind of volumetric price yeah. referent. Um, how in the world do you do that and how complicated can it get? And, and how do we find ways in which folks who might either not understand how that works or might disagree on how it should be added to a price to kind of Come to come to terms on on what that price should be. Yep, yep. 
And it was Ed when I when I mentioned you know, when I said that you know some some transactive projects are grounded in the idea of locational marginal pricing from wholesale markets. It was Ed and TMix was exactly what I had in mind, and and I think that's important because again LMP is conveys the idea that prices are informative, that that prices communicate valuable information, and the the challenge. And in, in the challenge in trying to create a synthetic price signal that reflects those long-term fixed charges is very similar to the challenge that we've had for 100 years in rate design in a setting where you're trying to create a synthetic price signal where you're building in some of that fixed cost into the price signal is still the same kind of problem. In, in the great electricity market design conflicts, you know, there's there's the kind of the energy only wholesale market versus the capacity construct wholesale market, you know, uh, market designs. And I tend to be very much an energy only market design uh, economist because, and the idea there is that, um, you know, the market clearing price, in the periods when there's scarcity and the market clearing price is high enough that the resources that are earning that will have producer surplus and that producer surplus provides them with resources that they then use to invest right and so that's the that's the logic in energy only markets is the producer surplus is what leads you to build generation um, and i think this is a similar you can make a similar argument that if you rely on a, a kind of just a clear price signal um, and that price signal generates producer surplus that you can, um, if, if it's the, if you're in a utility framework and it's the utility that's on the buy, on the, on the sell side, that producer surplus is what gives them revenues to be able to invest in those, in those longer term fixed costs. Um, but I think there are a lot of arguments that would go against that. But then that gets you to the question of, well, you know, you have to design your markets to achieve the objectives that you want to achieve. And one thing that's true, and I should apologize because I tend to bring philosophy a lot into my market design work. And so I'm going to use a philosophy word here that markets are non teleological, right? Markets don't have outcomes they, they don't have they don't have kind of deterministic end goals right right it's the individual participants who themselves have end goals yeah and they participate in markets to achieve those end goals and so how do we start to think differently about the fact that you can have this real decentralized system and these participants have their own end goals and how can you align that with the system without with the system having kind of a very loose end goal of, you know, reliability and resilience. Yeah, obviously, Texas winter storm Yuri has uh, raised those questions yeah. all over again. Um, I, I did want to uh, bring up a question that that kind of bears on on what you're just describing, which is from uh, Canary Media's own Moha Robinson, which is basically how do we uh, enable you know transactive energy. Yeah, or distributed coordination as a vehicle for socio-economic uh, equity in the energy sector. Many of us feel that it is uh, part of our responsibility as a social compact in terms of how we require our monopoly utilities to manage things to make sure that we bring uh, more equity to every participant in this energy transformation. Oh, so many, so many good thoughts in there. Um, I, I, I'll just to connect to our earlier conversation. I will start with another reference to dynamic pricing. So this idea that um, not it, it, even if you have a fairly small portion of of load that is is on a dynamic price, that can still um, mitigate price spikes. And if it mitigates price right. spikes, it's not, and you're the responsive one, it doesn't just lower your price. It lowers everyone right. else's prices. At least that's true in, in markets. It's mm -hmm. less, um, it's less obvious that that dynamic happens in vertically integrated utilities because they do not operate as markets, right? And so 
if I take some action that reduces my cost, that doesn't necessarily lower your cost because that lower energy cost isn't necessarily going to get passed through that quickly. It goes through the kind of, you know, the rate case sausage making process. So in areas that have uh, competitive retail and competitive markets that um, price responsiveness by some small portion of the population can reduce energy costs for everyone else. And that's an important dynamic not to be forgotten. Um, but there, you know, there's more, there's more we can do. And, and this is where both, I think the market design stuff is important and policy is important. Um, on the market design front, you know, I think lowering barriers to participation is important. And so, uh, you know, programs that, um, discount thermostats and um, and here I'm gonna I'm gonna give a shout out more to the ecobees of the world than the nests of the world because you know nest uh, nest is not is not very conducive to a transactive system it's because it's not an open API so so having low barriers to participation is I think important make you know the devices themselves become cheaper over time um, and have it as part of low income programs, to um, you know, to give to to give homeowners uh, ecobee or or renters ecobees, um, and this again, you mentioned the the winter storm in Texas. Uh, I think this question of equity dovetails with the questions of energy efficiency that came up. That you know, I think if we want to, if we want to have transactive capabilities open to folks. Um, at all income levels, that um, that kind of transactive design vision and energy efficiency in buildings is a they're really important kind of tag team members, mm -hmm. and and so I think you know having um, low income housing programs, whether they're um, utility run. Uh, government run, private charity run. You know, I'm I'm a big I'm a big believer that we overlook the potential role that philanthropy can play in in uh, improving the the building and and energy systems potential for low income uh, citizens. A transactive system, I think, would would work really well in a in a scenario like Texas, where you have a robust retail market. Um, it uh, the other one that I would add is community solar and thinking about ways to do community solar where it's not necessarily the utility that's doing the community solar. It could be a third party and, um, you know, that uh, having um, having it put it, having the, the solar in a low income neighborhood and having some of these energy efficiency and technology investments in that neighborhood. Um, right. Yep. Certainly, I think in New York, at least, we've seen a couple of community fuel cell and community battery projects where I believe the subscribers are essentially seeing the value in their reduced energy bills for uh, agreeing to subscribe based on the revenues that the asset is able to collect from either mm -hmm. on ed for a distribution kind of, you know, a kind of upgrade reduction or from the NISO kind of ICAP market, you know, to, to reduce capacity costs. So. It's pretty interesting. Um, I, I did want to give a, a, a quick check in to the second most popular question from Isaac Mudge uh, regarding the energy cost of running all the software to operate all these markets and how does it compare to or how does it make use of kind of blockchain or distributed ledger technology to reduce those costs? Energy costs are actually not that high. You know, a lot of these are kind of, um, you know, low voltage low voltage digital control devices. Um, so I think they're not that high. Again, not an engineer, but um, but the, the since since the B word has come up, um, I will mention some of the ways that we're thinking. It's It took 49 minutes to get the blockchain word on here. <laughs> I think that's a record. Um, that we definitely are thinking in terms of blockchain and and it's more, not so much about the energy consumption of this, the the operational part of the system itself. It's more, um, and this may be kind of an alternative to the the rates design in Southern California Edison. It's more that 
um, some of the grid services and some of the system benefits that individual device owners are going to have the capability to provide are not necessarily things that you're going to be able to observe in real time. And so you can have this like real time energy transaction. But um, I mean, in the case of and I'll just give the example from Holy Cross Energy just as an example, uh, because they're interested in managing that coincident peak charge, which is very high. They'll do their forecasting and they'll figure out, um, you know, and so they'll call a coincident peak and, and kind of send out that high price signal, say, four times in a month. And one of those four will end up being the actual coincident peak. But there will be four times there where we've got the device, the device owners engaging the transactive, transactive capabilities of their devices and, and taking some action that can be beneficial to the system. But you're not necessarily going to know until the end of the month which of those four was the actual coincident peak. And so right. you're only going to know in hindsight what the true what the true value of the grid service was that those that those device owners provided. And so essentially what we're thinking about is using a blockchain platform to uh, when in in those four in those four time periods, what they do is if they respond, they in addition to changing the energy price, they earn tokens. And uh -huh. that then at the end of the month, they have a, um, a supply of tokens that they've earned. And once we, at the end of the month, we can basically settle all the accounts and figure out how much saving Holy Cross Energy got from that. And then we can divvy that up in a share weighted way, according to how many tokens you, you earned. Um, mm -hmm. And so, that's the way in which we're thinking about using blockchain. And um, there's some really there's some really cool theory about how to do this that comes from cooperative game theory, and it uses a concept called the Shapley value. And it's a it's a really cool model that that is in a context where you have a group of people and they have to work together to create some particular, you know, do they create the, the cooperative outcome? And if so, how do you figure out who contributed how much to the effort to to the ultimate success? And then you use this this Shapley value calculation to figure out who gets what. Uh, right. We're, we're still right. working on that, that one. <laughs> you mentioned that maybe a transactive framework would be better than net metering based on volumetric you know, kind of at the meter rates. And I know that there are a couple of proposals at least that use the avoided cost calculator as a referent. Um, and the avoided cost calculator is what the CPUC has decided uh, a DER asset is worth across all 8,760 hours per year on a curve, depending on their transmission and distribution and greenhouse gas reduction benefits. And that it is administratively determined, and it is a matter of great controversy right now in California because the CPUC just decided that it's worth a lot less in the future because they just decided to build a ton of utility scale solar, which makes mm -hmm. the distributed replacements for it much less. But other people say, how can you know what's going to happen in the future? And don't you think building that much utility scale is crazy compared to encouraging or distributed through a more favorable avoided cost calculator? metric so yeah. a whole another can of worms <laughs> <laughs> well and this is this is the opportunity for me to invoke my second uh, philosophy comment first was teleology uh, the second is you know this gets into knowledge right and so right. my question back is you know avoided cost to whom and of what and how do you know that that's the avoided cost right so this gets us into the epistemology and I think the epistemology of markets, at least for me, is a really important foundation for, for transactive systems because what you're doing in a transactive system is you're basically honoring the, the idea that different individuals have different preferences, different opportunity costs, and that only they know them. And that, as you said, this avoided cost is administratively determined. And, and so um, 
it's going to be a rough estimate at best of an underlying real avoided cost. So it's essentially the avoided cost to the utility in what's essentially still a monopoly regulated framework. And um, I think my concern about the kind of net energy metering 3.0 and, and you, you kind of gestured at it with the comment about, uh, you know, isn't building all this utility scale solar when we could instead rely on distributed solar, isn't that gonna kind of foreclose that, that different future? Um, and that's precisely my concern is that is if you, if, if you make this administrative bureaucratic choice to go down a particular road, in this case, investing in you know, high fixed costs, utility scale resources, are you foreclosing the opportunity to do things a different way that might actually be more beneficial? Yeah, it, incredibly tricky. Um, we are in our last minute, everyone. So I better save the questions about how we incorporate the desire of individuals to pay more for renewable sources or lower carbon sources and all the other really good questions, which I want to thank everyone again uh, for um, for another time. Uh, no, this has been a great conversation. Thank you for, uh, for uh, inviting me and chatting with me and thanks to everyone for the great questions. Thank you.